Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts who explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. To our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. As a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. It's a topic that dominates nearly every aspect of today's national security dialogue, the space power imperative. We've long known that space assets are vital for empowering military operations on Earth, whether helping a squad of troops navigate, directing a precision guided munition from an aircraft to the target, providing vital weather data to a ship at sea, giving an installation missile advance warning threat system, or linking the entire joint force together on a global communications network. These systems, plus the guardians who operate them, are interwoven into the fabric of modern military operations on a level that's hard to overstate. And that's exactly why our adversaries are striving to contest this domain. They want to hold our assets in space at risk to deny this crucial advantage. Now make no mistake, space is now a warfighting domain. We didn't want it this way, but our adversaries acted and we've got to respond. On top of all that, we're now moving past the model of space merely as a domain to support actions on Earth. We're now seeing missions that will be wholly executed on orbit, and we'll also see terrestrial domains act as the supporting command to space, a total inversion of what we're used to seeing. Add this all up, and that's exactly why the Space Force must reinvent almost every aspect of its space architecture. They are getting away from the mega satellites, what General Hyten called big, fat, juicy targets, to constellations that are far more disaggregated. They're looking at far faster tech refresh cycles, introducing things like maneuver on orbit and pressing far past Earth orbit to regions like cislunar space. To make that happen, we need industry engagement. Let's face it, the Space Force can develop all the concept they want, but it takes companies to build the tech. And that's what we're here to talk about today. The changes Space Force is pursuing are going to have major impacts on the space industrial base. To better understand what's at play, we're happy to have Scott Forney, president of the Electromagnetic Systems at General Atomics, is with us on the podcast today. GA EMS is a lead actor helping build out this new space architecture with the Space Force. They're involved on the Tranche 2 effort with Space Development Agency, and they're building part of their replacement for the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program. They're pioneering domain awareness technology in the cislunar region. Folks on their team are also experts when it comes to laser communications, and they're even looking at things like nuclear thermal propulsion a key for maneuvering on orbit. And I could keep going, but bottom line, you'd be hard-pressed to find another team more aligned with where we're going in space power than Scott's. Well, Scott, sir, welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I appreciate that, Slick. It's our pleasure to be able to talk to you and the Mitchell Institute about all the exciting things going on in space right now. It is a whole different world, isn't it? Absolutely. And we've really been leaning into discussing all the new things going on with space since we have Charles Galbraith, our Space Power Advantage Center of Excellence, and he is on the show. So Charles, welcome. Thanks, Slick. Always good to be here and and great to have Scott with us today. Yes. And, you know, no podcast is really complete without having Major General Retired Larry Stutz, Stutz Ream. So Stutz, welcome back to the Aerospace Advantage. Hey, Slick. It's a pleasure to be back. Well, I tell you, we've got some great energy w- with you all, and I'm so excited to, to just dive right in. So, Charles, I'm just going to ask you, can you set the scene for us? And, you know, we've uh, been really looking forward to this episode for a while because it cuts to the essence of what's happening in space power. But you're the expert. You know, I tried to explain the dynamics in the opener, but can you expand on what's at play? Yeah, certainly, Slick. And as always, you, you did a really good job in the intro. So I don't have a whole lot to add, but. You know, the the legacy space capabilities that uh, are are mostly in orbit right now, uh, they were developed for a time when space was not a contested domain. And we did an incredible job over the past 30 years or so of integrating space, not only into our daily lives, but into the way that we conduct military operations. And it's made us far more effective as as a nation and our allies. And that has not gone unnoticed by our potential adversaries who are at the same time investing a lot of money and effort to develop capabilities to take out that advantage and also to to exploit space for their own capabilities. And so as we move 
to focusing on great power competition with, with a nation like China, we have to find a way to preserve our space capabilities, maintain our advantage, not let them exploit space in a manner that's harmful to us and to our, our men and women in uniform. And, and, you know, a good analogy that I heard General Saltzman explain during the warfare symposium back in February was the space capabilities we have today are like a merchant marine vessel. They're designed to carry a lot of capability and, you know, get stuff from point A to point B, but they were not designed for combat. And now we have to shift that focus from, from a merchant marine vessel to almost an aircraft carrier. And so how do we change our architecture to be ready for a, a fight that extends to space? And ultimately, we're trying to deter conflict from space. But really, one of the best ways to do that is to show potential adversaries that we're ready and that there's no way that they could win. Yeah, it's such an interesting dynamic. And Stutz, I want to bring you into uh, contrast with Charles just said and what he laid out with the, about the legacy model. So when you were flying in the 80s and 90s plus commanding forces in the 2000s, you really didn't have to worry about the resilience of our space assets. Is that is that right? No, that's that's totally right. It wasn't even the, in the thought that somebody would try to interrupt it, space at that time in the 1980s. It was a place from which to take images and listen to things, and we had extraordinary freedom of access. Um, with our craft in space, but we had limited capability. Um, you know, take imagery, for example, imagery of the Earth and potential targets on the Earth. There was a small number of very expensive imagery satellites. And today, we would cringe at that architecture. It is, It was very vulnerable, but it wasn't, it, there was no uh, desire to try to attack it. So resilience of those platforms in space was not something that was ever an issue. What was an issue is that the information didn't flow to the warfighter. Um, it was processed by intelligence and then disseminated. And so the freshness of the images was poor for those of us at the battle space edge. They were kept in files. The freshness of those photographs were dependent upon when those targets, potential targets, would be next prioritized in a collection deck. Um, so the, par the paradigm back then was highly bureaucratized. It was about, not about, uh, you know, how to get this information to the war fighter as soon as possible. Uh, and and I'd, I just want to add, Charles is the expert here, so I, 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 I tread lightly, but the collection deck is based upon a fixed number of shots that those satellites could take. And you had every agency in government wanting to get their interest looked at. And so th there was a staffing of those priorities. It was very regimented and approved at a very high level. Now, let me go 20 years later to Afghanistan. And right after 9-11, we had three weeks to plan for the routing of Taliban and, and attack on Al-Qaeda camps in uh, Afghanistan. And we could not get imagery whatsoever because Afghanistan had not been prioritized. But there were arguments about classifications and whether that could be given to us in the Air Operations Center. And so very perplexing that in many ways we could not get the priority despite the trauma that the attack on the World Trade Center uh, had on the country. We couldn't get that. And by the way, even if we could, we didn't have the communication pipelines that were big enough or secure enough to let us get that. So once again, to Slick, I'll just say, no, we didn't. In both those episodes, we just had complete access to space. We didn't care, but there were other other issues that prevented us from getting that information. Yeah, thanks for that, Stutz. And, you know, Charles, thinking back, you know, you were in uniform when the idea of space as a contested domain emerged. So was there a light bulb moment? I mean, we talked you know, to General Chilton about this before. And he was a commander at STRATCOM when the Chinese launched their anti-satellite missile in 2007. And that was certainly a big moment. And from a public perspective, we also remember when General Hyten went on 60 Minutes and described the threat back in 2015. So can you walk us through what it was like to live through this era where the, you know, foundational assumptions regarding space power really began to shift? Yeah. So it wasn't so much a light bulb moment where you're, it's dark and then suddenly it's light. It was more of a, a decades long flicker that, that occurred. I mean, we knew that there were threats coming to our space capabilities back in the 90s. Um, in fact, the, the Space Commission report that was released at the beginning of 2001 
really warned of a space Pearl Harbor and how potential adversaries were, were growing their counter space capabilities to attack us because they saw that as a vulnerability. Uh, but of course, 9-11 happened. And so our, our attention globally and certainly within the United States uh, shifted from trying to secure those uh, space activities to uh, routing the Taliban and Al Qaeda. Um, and then in 2007, when the Chinese you know, conducted that ASAT test, we had further proof that there was a, uh, a threat to our space capabilities and that we needed to do something about it. And again, our attention was still focused on activities uh, in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, and, and then by that time, Iraq, of course. And, you know, I, I can't fault history. It is what it was. We certainly have to uh, balance our priorities. But from a space perspective, those in the space community, it was like we hit the snooze button in, in 2001. We hit it again in 2007. And then it wasn't until we were able to start talking about space as a contested domain openly, you know, in about the 2015 timeframe, and certainly when the Space Force uh, became a service to say that space was and is a, a warfighting domain, a contested domain that really sparked the, the public discussion and the ability to say, we have to do things to counter those threats, to preserve our space capabilities, and even now deny those benefits to potential adversaries. So flicker over decades, but certainly when the Space Force became an entity and U.S. Space Command became an entity, it really began to, to focus attention. Yeah, amazing. And, you know, I really want to get Scott in here for an industry viewpoint, because I'd really be interested, sir, in when you began to see this evolution, you know, was there a particular moment that when it became clear or was this a process as well? Yeah, great question. Um, f first of all, if you look at General Atomic's legacy, we've been in the space, space game since 1958, off and on. We spent 1958 through the early 70s really uh, advancing technology for nuclear power, whether it was in radioisotope-based power for NAVSAT programs or whether it was for the Project Orion, which was a pulse detonation propulsion system, or later on, we supported the NERVA rover program um, by delivering 6,000 kilograms of kernels for their nuclear thermal propulsion. So, you know, Things change. We got out of it. We got back into it when high power solar was uh, available. Uh, and then we went back into the icy moons program. It just kept, we kept going back to the same thing, which was nuclear power, because obviously that's the beginning of the company is, is atomic energy. However, for me, there was a defining moment. Uh, it was in the, around 2012 or 13 uh, when I started looking at hypersonics and what our adversaries were up to. And when you start looking at those challenges, the first thing we needed to do is figure out how, how are we going to be able to have um, real-time situational awareness for hypersonics or other missiles. But hypersonics was got me concerned back in that time period. I recall being in a meeting with uh, Will Roper when he was had started out the Special Capabilities Office, and somehow a light went off on me. Uh, and we looked at we, – we do very well at Airborne for real-time situational awareness – you know, the company has delivered, I don't know, 1,100 or so um, unmanned aerial systems between the Predator and Reaper, et cetera. And we do very good at the airborne situational awareness. But how do we take that to space? That, that was what I was worried about, starting with hypersonics. And as things progressed, we were trying to find our way um, because it's very hard to break in um, to this world of space because most of our competitors, you know, have been doing this since Moby Dick was a minnow. So what, what strategic capability do we offer that perhaps distinguishes us and allows us to get into space? We started slow by looking at CubeSats and then advanced ourselves into what kind of payloads are we interested in? And so, as you know, we're involved with the EOIR weather system with um, Space Force to replace the Defense Meteorological uh, Satellite Program. But to me, that payload is ISR. It's just ISR of, of clouds and, and weather conditions. Fast forward, the two very big areas that we focused on are what are the technologies that we have developed on terrestrial applications, airborne application, how do we put that into space? And one of them is definitely ISR. The second one is, is how do we deal with establishing very good LPI, LPD. And that's why the company pursued laser communication. And we've been taking our time making sure that when we launch next year on two Manhattan half-ESPA satellites, 
that that technology will deliver uh, what it's intended to do. Um, fast forward, we are involved with the hypersonics program in many ways today, and it's, it's, it's very exciting that I think we're going to start delivering on some of this capability that got us initially interested. Yeah, and I really want to dive into that a little bit more, Scott, because under your leadership, the company grew aggressively and stands as a leading innovator uh, in the defense space industry. And I would assume it had to be a tough pivot from the old style, you know, space architecture to the current push for proliferated constellations and exploring cislunar and other associated new technology pursuits. So uh, bottom line, what drove you and GAEMS to want to engage in this journey to help build out a new national security space architecture? Well, it's kind of simple math. Uh, the math is as a privately held company, we have uh, an agility that a lot of the larger, I'll say publicly traded companies may not have always the same capability. Uh, our owner is very focused on 10 to 50 years out. Let's go fast. Let's go figure it out. We want to make sure that the United States warfighter has whatever it, it takes to defend the Republic. It's that simple. So when we look at new space, the challenge for us was we had to invest handsomely to get into the program. We, we really had to build clean rooms. We had to hire engineers. Uh, we had to build facilities uh, that would allow us to do environmental testing. And we had to build space mission operations centers on the bet that we would be successful. That's probably the biggest challenge for us is that we had to make tough financial decisions over the last five years, which we did. And today, I think it's paying off. Um, we have, you know, somewhere in the order of 50 satellites either um, being tested in space now or we're building for the warfighters and for others. So that that was it for us. In addition to that, we've been very careful at acquiring um, the right niche companies that gave us an advantage to go after the things that I've talked about, about how important it is to get into these niche marketplaces. Well, Charles, when you look at this new architecture, is there a paradigm that's helpful so people can you know, get their minds around it? I mean, we've really got everything from low Earth orbit into deep space activities like cislunar. We also have new attributes like dynamic space operations. And you know, will all of these new communications technologies you know, be able to stitch everything together? And how do you classify these lanes of activity? Thanks, Lick. There certainly is a lot of activity going on in space, and, and that's a good thing. Some of the activities are to continue to provide the same sorts of services that we did when we, we weren't a separate service. Some of the activities are focusing on assuring our access to space and are securing those interests in space. So those are things, launch satellite operations, but also defending our capabilities in space and potentially denying an adversary to use theirs. And then the third category is really as we move out to cislunar space, the types of activities that we need for this whole new regime, this whole new frontier of space activity to support civil and commercial ventures to the moon and beyond. Well, Scott, you guys are really involved with almost every dimension of what Charles laid out. And I, I want to better understand how you tackle these sort of challenges on the business level and in the industry side. So let's start with what it takes to replace a legacy capability with new architecture and associated technologies. And one of the examples that comes to mind, you're part of the team working on replacing the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program, what we call in the military DMSP. So it is the backbone of the DOD's weather sensing capability and no mission executes without considering weather. So can you walk us through uh, where you begin just tackling something like that? I mean, DMSP has existed in various forms for decades. So how do you begin with coming up with a new solution plan? This is a storied past for us because we've tried several times to get it right, candidly. But when I say that, it's because look at what's going on today. I think today there's uh, in excess of 11,000 satellites orbiting the Earth. Not all of them are functioning, but at least 70% probably are functioning. If you go back just a decade ago, we, we had like 1,200 or so satellites orbiting the Earth. We launched more satellites last year than all were in operation in 2014. Take a pause and think about that for a minute. We're, we're literally 10 times more in space orbits than we were a decade ago. So what's it going to be like 10 years from now? So when we look at some of these legacy programs, you really have to think quick. You have to be able to move with the times. And we don't need something that's going to last two decades anymore. We need to be able to have resiliency, but we also need to be upgradable. So from General Atomic standpoint, uh, 
you know, one of our biggest programs at General Atomic CMS is the aircraft carrier program. We, we developed the launch and arresting systems. So the future carrier fleets, depending on whether to get it right, when you look at our MQ-9 Reapers or other unmanned systems, the General Atomics Aeronautical Systems produces, they're counting on getting the weather right. So when we looked at the first weather opportunity, it was part of the ORS program. We tried to bid on fixing a weather satellite by taking the technology that had been delivered that wasn't functioning correctly and fixing it. The, the Air Force at that time decided not to go down that path. And so then they bid again. Um, about seven years ago on a program that, that doesn't matter, but we bid on that program and I learned something important because we offered an option, think for a second satellite that was for a prototype. And when we provided that option, it, it was counted against us in our price bogey. So we now know we're not going to offer options. So, <laughs> so who we lost to though, we studied them carefully on what did they do different than we did? Well, that program uh, was called Speedy, and the program was canceled quickly because of uh, a protest, I believe, but whatever the reason. Fast forward to the new opportunity from Space Force, the EOI weather system, because we had studied it twice, this time we were careful of picking out the right payload and the, the right size bus, not offering an option. So it was exciting for us to win, but coming with that came tens of millions of dollars of investment to make sure that we could build it in the right environment, that we can environmentally test it, and that we'd be able to support the program for several decades, including the ground support and all the analysis systems. So we picked the right companies to work with, such as Parsons and AER, to make sure that we had the best team out there. And that's how I think we won the program. Plus, our optical sensor systems team in Acton, Massachusetts, did just a marvelous job at making a low-cost, low-swap payload, which now that payload we're modifying for future ISR applications. So, so that, that was our approach to replacing DMSP. And, and now we're working with Space Force SSC to make sure that Space Systems Command can trust us to be there for the long haul, to provide the, the amount of satellites to build the constellation, and also to maintain the ability to upgrade and provide replacements when the constellation requires us. That means we have to spend IRAD every year to stay current, and, and we do. We're, we're very, very proud of our relationship with uh, the Space Force on many programs, uh, but I would say a franchise program for us is EWS, and it's, it's a pleasure working with the SSC team. Well, Stutz, you were the director of Air Force Weather back when this kicked off years ago. So do you remember the early stages of this effort? Oh, my gosh, I do. Um, and I wish Scott was there at that time to help us out. It would have been fantastic. But I will say there were several failed attempts to replace DMSP, the weather satellite uh, constellation. And the program I was involved in was INPOS. It failed not because of anything except requirements couldn't stabilize and be defined. It was run by an interagency group. There was a coordinator without any authority to make choices in terms of requirements and priorities. And the process languished. Everybody wanted what they wanted, and the system became a Frankenstein, and it collapsed under its own weight. So that's the problem is that there's not a real high regard for how important it is to have a dedicated defense weather and environmental monitoring system up there in space. And, and I'll go back to what Scott said. Every flight brief of every service begins with weather in the U.S. military. And history is filled with examples of what happens if you don't have dominance in that particular information. You're, you're going to lose. Your adversary is going to use it against you. We need to have certainty that the most important element of planning combat operations is there for us. But we do have, uh, as, as Scott said, a very, very successful program underway that his uh, company is part of. That's the uh, EWS, the Electro-Optical Infrared Weather System. And, and it's performing well, but Government needs to now provide that, that proliferated architecture and get serious about it to get the kind of revisit rates we need that the warfighter needs in today's modern warfighting concepts. We need to have the best sensors. We need to have plenty of these satellites, maybe dozens built out in a constellation to make sure that the warfighter is getting what they require. 
And so the urgency is clear. The program needs to be on a wartime footing. And once again, all is performing well. Now build out the constellation. Well, well, Scott, you know, we often say on the aerospace advantage, space is hard. But what you just illustrated as far as going through the process of a government contract with, you know, the requirements and protests and all this other stuff, that seems really hard too. So can you walk us through how the requirements process works and how GA entered the fold and, and how you see this architecture meeting General Sossman's vision? Great, great question. And I want to go back to something that Charles said that he quoted Salty. Um, I met with Salty too um, last month at the AWS AFA uh, Warfare Conference. And he knows a little bit about my background, which I was in the Merchant Marine. I was in the Navy. So when I walked in the room to meet with him, he he said, I hope I didn't insult you by making a comment that it's like taking a Merchant Marine and building into U.S. Navy. I thought that was a perfect quote. Yeah. Because if you go back to World War I or World War II, what did we do? It's kind of the same thing in some regards. Now, there was uh, other investments made. So doing this in space, it's it's just a great analogy. I personally have used that quote in other uh, speeches, and I've certainly attributed to uh, General Saltzman, but I think it's a great quote. So when you look at the architecture requirements, you know, a lot of the requirements, of course, we're not going to talk about because of classified uh, requirements. But overall, we can get behind several of the Space Command and Space Force requirements. I want to quote the former Deputy Commander of Space Command, Lieutenant General John Shaw, because his one of his key concern was that the U.S. surveillance satellites that monitor monitor hostile activities. We were at a huge disadvantage, and, and, and it's getting worse. So his mantra was maneuver without regret. Boy, can we get behind that? And maneuver out with regret means many things to many people. Take the legacy systems, figure out how to refuel them, or basically bolt on a new propulsion system in space to get extended life. But we got to think ahead now for the new architecture. There's going to be a lot of them. So can we make better energy power uh, systems? And GA has been investing for several several years, probably nearly uh, a decade or more, on uh, a new kind of radioisotope thermal voltaic uh, system that would allow us to provide either trickle charging to keep the batteries going in the case that we lose solar for some time period or nuclear reactors of all kinds. And I, maybe we're ahead of our time right now. There, there are many activities right now for NASA and for Space Force, but we need to be able to maneuver without regret. And for our Pico satellites, you know, these are satellites that literally I can hold in my hands. Um, We've developed some very, very unique, advanced six degree of freedom capabilities so that we have closer to maneuver out regret. So uh, one thing that I have to bring in, though, is is with all this upgrade in space, to be able to bring the Merchant Marine into the Navy, one thing that we cannot lose sight on is the ground systems that support these architectures. That's, That's not GA's forte. So we go out and seek uh, partners, but that's one area that I think we all have to be very, very focused on. And the last thing I'll say is regarding the architecture, the Honorable Frank Calvelli, um, obviously he heads up the acquisitions for space. He, he has stated that he wants to make cheaper commoditized satellites that can be deployed more frequently. And I love that idea of putting satellites in the barn, being able to change out payloads depending on what the warfighter needs and being able to commoditize these things. So, you know, we're certainly looking at all those aspects to make sure we support the warfighter. So we're all in. Well, Scott, you are certainly all in. And another area that you're involved in is with the Space Development Agency's Tranche 2 effort. So what is that and how does it speak to the more disaggregated set of capabilities we often hear our Space Force leaders discussing? Well, the Space Development Agency is a really, really interesting organization. I, I have to give you background. You know, we, we General Atomic CMS have tried three times to get into the proliferated uh, business with uh, Derek Tournier's team. We bid on Tranche Zero, we bid on Tranche One, both transport and tracking layers, and, and couldn't make our way in. So you would say, well, then why are you still doing it? Well, we, we bid again, but this time, instead of priming it, we bid a payload, uh, a two payloads to our prime. And we're very thankful that Lockheed Martin chose uh, our team to provide the tracking layer and fire control solutions. And we're, we're delighted that the Space Development Agency has actually stayed to a schedule. I mean, they have an aggressive program to go after proliferated LEO. They have stayed to a schedule. 
both from a, a spec development and industry interaction, get the RFP out, get the bids evaluated and make awards. Um, so it's a, it's a whole different world for all of us. And, and for us, I'm back to my 2012, 2013 time period when I was worried about hypersonics and how are we going to be able to do the ISR that the company's been known for for years, airborne, how do we take it to space? So we are just honored that Lockheed Martin chose us to be able to provide the right tracking layer, ISR capability and fire control solution payloads. Um, we're early in the journey, but this this is exactly what got me hooked on space, you know, more than a decade ago. So we are doing other things with the Space Development Agency. Um, we have developed um, low LPI, LPD, laser communications. So we have several contracts with uh, the SDA to make sure that we demonstrate capability, whether it's cross links at 5,500 kilometers or if we're be able to talk down uh, to a, a Reaper or down to the ground. These are all very, very exciting. So SDA was a welcome organization, and I'm glad to see they're under Space Force now so that it, it fulfills the mission that General Salzman has uh, provided. Well, Charles, I want you to hop in here. Why is this so important? I mean, it's a really new paradigm for the Space Force, uh, big picture. We're not talking about launching a satellite, you know, the size of a school bus and hoping it lasts for a decade or two. This is way more distributed and dynamic, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's important for a variety of reasons. Um, let, let's start with the threat. When you have that large, high value asset, it, it's, it's a more tempting target than a distributed architecture of, of cheaper satellites. Then let's talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, technology refresh. The ability to, to put up and hold to a tight schedule, a series of smaller, less expensive satellites um, is fundamental to infusing the right technology refresh capabilities over time. So you don't have to worry about a satellite lasting for 20 years using 20-year-old technology by the time its, its life is over. You're looking at a three to five-year lifespan with a tech refresh rate of every couple of years. So that's absolutely important. Another aspect is the mission itself. Um, you know, We talked a little bit about hypersonics and cruise missile technologies and the types of threats that we're going to need to counter from a ballistic missile and in non-ballistic trajectories from space. And so the, 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 the thought of tracking heat signatures from geosynchronous orbit very far away, it becomes less tenable. So you have to get closer to that heat source. You're going to have to get to a lower orbit, and therefore you're going to have to have a wider array of, of sensors collecting over the, the flight path of, of those hypersonic vehicles. So that's going to become absolutely critical. That's a you know, proliferated low Earth orbit is, is critical to enabling that type of mission. And, and that's a forerunner for some of the other missions that we're going to see uh, coming down uh, to the Space Force in the future. The ground moving target indications, uh, I think, is going to leverage some of the lessons learned from the Space Development Agency as they move forward. And then that will transition to air moving target indications uh, in the future. So proliferated low Earth orbit constellations, they you know, help address the threat, they help enable the mission itself, and they're going to pave the way for, for other mission sets. Well, Scott, I, you know, I've got to ask you this question, having been a, a co-founder of a defense company. What does it mean for you when you look up setting up production facilities, sustaining a workforce and everything else with this new model? I mean, you know, I'm guessing your workforce and facilities look a lot different uh, than what we would have seen 20 or 30 years ago working in legacy construct, right? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. First of all, we're fortunate to be very vertically integrated. Um, so whether it's the satellite or electronics or the payload, we have a, a unique capability to respond quicker uh, because we have those capabilities across the country. However, when it comes to being able to do the proper job at building satellites, whether they're satellites that fit in your hand or satellites that are 500 or 1,000 kilograms or in our case, we're also on Draper's team for the Commercial Lunar Payload System Program for NASA, where we had to build a clean room that we could put in 14-foot unmanned lunar landers that iSpace was building for a launch in 2026 to get to the far side of the moon. All very exciting, but you got to put a lot of money into it to get that infrastructure. I don't need to have a 17-foot tall uh, crane for anything other than this lunar lander, but 
we needed it so that we could go help our team win. So when you look at all the infrastructure, to me, one of the biggest things that we had to do is that we had to capture the environmental requirements. When I say that, a lot of our classified programs, you don't want to be shipping your product around the country. There's so much controls on those documents uh, and on the, the visuals of the hardware. So we made a decision early on that part of our production build out was going to include the large vibration tables for any size spacecraft that we envision so that we could test in-house. We're building an anechoic chamber so we can finalize all the EMI testing in-house. And then you have other test requirements that are also challenging, and that are the TVACs. When you want to bring temperatures and atmospheric conditions like vacuum, you have to be able to do that concurrently. This is all stuff that we, we didn't have five years ago, so we had to go invest in that. And oh, by the way, we were in our very nascent time period winning a couple of programs, so was the investment worth it? And then COVID struck. And, you know, we're all out of COVID now, but boy, was that challenging from the human side point because we couldn't hire engineers fast enough that wanted to stay around because they had to work at home. Yet we're the new, we're kind of like the new space company trying to do things differently. It was all new to us. Um, so fast forward to today, we've got that solved. We have the team working great together between the East Coast, the Colorado, the San Diego, Huntsville, Alabama, and our production facility to make the piece parts or do the weldments of the printed circuit boards in Tupelo, Mississippi, or Iuka, Mississippi. That's our center of excellence. And so if you come into any of our facilities, which is slick, don't go to Colorado without uh, visiting us or come out to San Diego. Make sure you – it's not an F-16, but I think you'll think it's pretty cool. <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely check it out for sure. You, know, you have made quite an investment. And, you know, Charles, you just released your paper on Cislunar Space. And, Scott, I know you are involved there too with a program called Oracle which looks at empowering domain awareness uh, in that region. So Charles, let's start with you. This is really pioneering type of work. And, and why does this matter? Yeah, Slick, so as I talked about in the paper, um, the race to the moon is, is critical for a, a whole host of reasons. Uh, there's national security implications for, for getting to the moon and, and making sure that we have domain awareness to prevent a, a surprise attack from, from someone utilizing the the, the the cislunar regime to to come back to the geocentric regime in an unwarned uh, attack angle. There's also scientific and, and potential economic interests in, in the cislunar environment that are going to, go, going to grow. But what we don't have is a lot of established norms and understanding of how we're going to conduct all of these operations in an international uh, environment. And when you look at what China and Russia are, are proposing in, in the cislunar environment, and the, the precedents that they've established in the South China Sea in particular, that territorial mindset that I'm going to get there first and I'm going to you know, control it and you're not going to be able to access it, that is not something we want to see established. And so getting to the moon first with the, the, the members of the Artemis Accords and, and peaceful, cooperative, transparent nations is absolutely critical. So what can we do from a military perspective to help accelerate those peaceful activities Let's establish some of the fundamental architecture that they're going to be able to use in the future. That starts with domain awareness, with, with activities like Oracle. It extends to communications capabilities. I think laser communications are going to be a, a huge benefit to the cislunar environment to, to send back scientific data from, from remote activities or, or, or from, uh, I'm sorry, uncrewed activities as well as from crewed activities. And when we have humanity back on the moon, keeping those humans in contact with the humans here on earth. So domain awareness, communications, navigations, propulsion, all of these capabilities are going to be foundational in this new frontier of, of the cislunar environment. Scott, I'd really like to get your take on, on Oracle and, and how that system, I think, needs to grow in the future from the technology demonstration that's being run out of AFRL to, I think, an operational architecture that's going to support domain awareness for that vast region of space, cislunar regime? Well, obviously, XGEO is a, a huge focus uh, for the company. We are really, really proud of our association with our prime, 
advanced space and, and the confidence that Brad Cheat and the founder of advanced space had in us and the AFRL RV for uh, selecting our team. So it's vitally important. It comes back to the story that got us interested in the first place. It's about ISR, but ISR doesn't mean you have to look at earth. There's a lot of other things to look at and the vastness of XGEO, whatever there is above 22,000 miles of, of orbit through Lagrange point two, where the James Webb is, boy, that's a, that's a massive task. But let's face it, um, you know, we, we recently had a successful private company, Intuitive Machines, land a lunar lander, an unmanned lunar lander on the moon. That's, it was 50 years since we did that as the United States, and it's great to see a friendly organization in the private sector make that happen. So we're going to see a lot more of that. Um, you know, we're hopeful that our team will succeed at landing on the moon. But space situational awareness is about looking at all the things that are going on in space. You may never look down at Earth. You may have no reason to. You're looking at who's coming by, who, what kind of technology uh, is there out there. There's all kinds of treaties that we should be able to depend on. But at the end of the day, you know, Ronald Reagan had it right. You got to trust but verify. So I think that's what SSA is all about. And on the Oracle program, these are some challenging things to do. We've, we've got to be able to hang out at Lagrange Point One and be able to check out the traffic. We have to have the right capabilities to see things well enough. Um, you know, I, I do believe that it doesn't stop at Lagrange Point One. It will be Lagrange Point Two so that we can see very well. But now you're at 550,000 kilometers away. So how are we going to be able to get all of that data down as real time as, as, you, as we want it? I don't think we're going to do it with RF technology. I think it's going to come down back to your point, uh, Charles. It's got to be laser communication, not just because it's low um, LPI, LPD, but it's also because it's the right technology to be able to stream as much information as you can. And the, the requirements for a proliferated LEO satellite a constellation of laser communication, very, very different than the requirements from 550 or 450,000 kilometers. So GA has been self-investing in differential phase shifting, which is an incoherent system, as compared to a coherent system, such as on-off keying that we use for something like a proliferated LEO constellation. I'm not getting techie on you other than to say, we have to keep investing for the next technology. Oracle doesn't require that today, but if we're gonna be successful at the Lagrange points, whether it's one, two, three, four, five, Whatever it's going to be, if we're going to be looking at the moon on other uh, opportunities, we need to have really, really, really tight communication capabilities. We need to make sure that we can handle the radiological environment that we're having to uh, deal with. And let's not forget how hard it is to get an orbital transfer in these domains. So I got to give a shout out to Elon Musk for what his company SpaceX has done. I mean, he did more launches last year as SpaceX than we did in its entirety in the world 10 years ago. And I, and I see no stop on that. We're all depending on it. And for General Atomic CMS, we've been fortunate enough to be able to launch on Falcon 9. We've been able to launch on Falcon Heavy. We've been able to launch on ULA. We've been able to launch on Rocket Labs. And we're working with Firefly. We, we hope that there's a future opportunity. The point is, there's so many ways to get to space, but that's a very different problem when you're trying to get orbital transfer out there. So I think that's one of the things that will come out of Oracle is what's the best approach for that and other programs that are XGO. And then the last thing, of course, is the camera systems will have to get better and better and the communication system will have to get better and better. And, and we uh, are really, really focused on that. And again, we couldn't do it without advanced spaces leadership on this program. So yeah, I give a shout out to their, their pioneering program with NASA called Capstone that demonstrates demonstrated the ability to operate for a year. And I don't know how many orbits he's done now, but that, that, that company is really special on their orbital mechanics. So I think together it's going to be a really fun program and we all have to learn from it. Well, let's dive into that a little bit more. Let's talk about, you know, the, the communication links and just how critical they are. So we'll get started with uh, Scott on this one. Well, the communication links today, you know, we, we know that we're proliferated with lots of great RF technology and all kinds of bands. Um, but I think the world kind of understands what to do with those bands. You can get in front of those and uh, perhaps uh, imagine a very, very, very large beam that uh, opens yourself up to intrusion. When you look at optical communication, it's a much smaller beam. Uh, therefore, it's it's a bigger problem. Um, how are you going to be able to deal with the 
the intrusion problems is probably something that today is, is not our challenge. The challenge really is, is to get the right architecture so you can communicate between all the activities that are going out, whether it's very low Earth orbit or XGEO, and be able to communicate uh, across the, uh, all the different platforms. And, and that is the reason why we have been spending money on differential phase shift keying, which was not a requirement. It was our goal because we were kind of limited at about two and a half gigabits per second of transfer cross links at five or so thousand kilometers or down to earth at about a gigabit per second. When you go to DPSK, which it's called, DBSK, we've been able to test to date to 32 gigabits per second. And now you're talking about a greater capability at long range. We, we don't want to communicate. We don't need to communicate, let's say, at 32 gigabits per second or 40 or whatever the number should be. But we need to be able to have enough oomph to get from 500,000 kilometers back to Earth. And so we want to minimize our, our aperture sizes. And therefore, if we go to these advanced technologies, we'll be able to meet the data rate requirements of the various opportunities, whether it's from cislunar, geo, meo, leo, and back and forth on earth, whether it's from platform to platform also, as you can imagine, you can now communicate airplane to airplane or down to a ship. There's so many opportunities and the technology today is so much more advanced the industrial base that supports the piece parts, our swap now is very, very good that we'll be able to fit on almost every application I can imagine. So that's why there's just so much emphasis today on optical communication. And Scott, let me uh, say the need for this is, you know, in the combat environment, our forces, the secret sauce, once again, I'll say, is information. And we are taking our force design, changing it with concepts like join all domain command and control. But what we're trying to do is get the right information at, to the right place to be able to maximize the combat power of our military forces. And so these technologies that, Scott, you've been working on, these are critically important to making these operational concepts a reality. They have to be secure. And I think your optical comms are, are clearly a very important part of that. Yeah. And another aspect uh, that I want to dive in on is... You talked about the low probability of intercept, low probability of detect for, for laser communications. And so if you're an adversary and, and you know that uh, your opponent is, is using this, you're not going to go after the link so much. You might go after the actual node itself. And that's why it's so critical to have a proliferated architecture so that you can bounce between multiple nodes to get from point A to point B in a way that the adversary cannot stop. And so, you know, having a path agnostic ability to communicate with our assets in, in LEO and GEO and CISLUNAR is absolutely critical to assure that communications pipeline. Another great aspect about optical comms is the, the bandwidth that you can get through, the, the amount of throughput of data. And right now, the NASA's deep space communications network is already saturated. If we start expanding our activities in CISLUNAR like we intend to, that system is going to be you know, obsolete in no time. And only, I believe, optical communications allows us to get the, the amount of information back to the people that need it in a manner that, that is useful. Um, I applaud intuitive machines as well for, for landing on, on the surface of the moon successfully and, and the first commercial entity to ever do that. But one of the things that frustrated me was, okay, we, uh, we have confirmation we have reached the surface of the moon and we are communicating. Well, I really would have liked to have seen a picture. <laughs> I really would have liked to have seen some of that communications and having greater domain awareness and having greater communications capability would have enabled that. Um, so, you know, I'm excited about where we can go with optical communications in CISLUNAR, but also how it's going to impact operations here on Earth uh, and in the geocentric regime. I've got to ask you this. If you were king for the day, talk to us through some of the adjustments you'd make to help manifest General Sossman's vision. And Stutz, we'll get started with you on your military commander perspective. Uh, first, I, I, I'm serious about this. I keep Saltzman in the chief's chair for about a decade. Uh, he is the right man at the right time for bringing Space Force into its full, full capability, full size, modernizing it. I mean, and his vision is not defined by bumper stickers and slogans. It, 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 is, it is hard um, and it's deliberate. And he's a warrior. We all know him. Um, so 
let me lay that aside because he's not going to stay for 10 years. But first, Congress needs to get very serious about the things that are needed to manifest this vision of where the space force is going. Consolidation, consolidation, consolidation. There is one thing the stand up of the space force revealed. It was that we really needed to stand up a space force. It needs to bring all capabilities that are right now splintered among the other services and other intel agencies together under the Space Force. That's where we get the most effort with the dollars we and resources we put into there. And then, of course, it has to have adequate funding, and it's got to have increased manpower to be able to do what it's been tasked to do. And then, as General Saltzman has done, is a more forthright willingness to talk about the reality of the threat, not hide behind you know security walls, get that out in the open. The public needs to understand that as well as Congress. So I would say, once again, I go back to, we know how China wants to affect the American way of war as it's being developed, even in our future force design. Space force exists to make sure we don't lose our space access and freedom of maneuver in that what is now war fighting domain. Yeah, amazing. And thanks for that. I want to get Scott in uh, to talk about what reforms would better help industry meet this vision. I mean, I can think of a, a long list, uh, everything from the funding issues and things that Stutz just talked about regarding the Catch-22 of facility clearances and co- classified defense contracts and a lot more. But I'd uh, love to hear what you have to say. Well, there are, there are many points that I think are worthy of discussing quickly. Um, number one, yeah, we all know that the ecosystem is changing, but lots and lots of things are classified. Um, earlier this year, Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks approved a new space classification policy, which we hope allows more access. Um, it makes it a little bit easier. But at the end of the day, we still do need classified programs. Therefore, whatever the United States government can do to enable more networking and communication and facilities, it seems to be the long pole for just about everything we do. So that, that to me, is a fundamental area that needs some focus. The second thing I would say is Congress needs to pass a budget. Not having predictable and sustainable budgets makes it really hard when you're investing hundreds of millions of dollars between internal R&D funding and capital. You've got to have the absorption prediction to make sure that you're not making terrible mistakes. And, you know, we just came through a horrible two year period of a pandemic when you couldn't count on anything. Honestly, it was it was horrible. I personally experienced multi year delays on contracts, which made our, our rates very challenged. We need Congress to pass a budget so that we can ensure that we can support these programs. Not to mention, let's face it, if we're going to envision what uh, the Space Force is all about, which I think Stutz has done a great job of, we, we need to be able to go defend the republic. That needs money and it needs it needs to have the right clearances, et cetera, uh, and reliability is all about it. The last thing I would like to say is because we have the ability to launch economically much better than ever before, because we don't need satellites to stay up for 20 years and to be as big as a school bus across the board, we now have the ability to do replacements and upgrades, replacements, upgrades. And I think, I, I think if you ask General Saltzman this, he would probably agree that an 85% solution that's fast is a better solution than a 100% solution that's slow. And I think we all have to adjust our thinking. It's okay if we do 85%. And I think that, that that we're seeing more and more of that, that there's an acceptance in some agencies, and we need to do that across the board when we want to make sure that we are, are able to meet the demands of protecting the republic. So picking up after, after Scott's comment, I agree 100% that we need the budget. You can't start new programs unless you have the budget. And so aligning the resources, aligning the the national leadership to understand the criticality of the Space Force mission and support it 100%. And I I know that they all support it, but that has to come to action. That has to result in the budget actually being set aside for the Space Force to grow and not to taper off where it is. It's got to continue to grow because the missions we're asking of the Space Force are continuing to grow. So, you know, if I were king for the day, that would be the number one thing I would get after is, is getting us the right budget that we need 
to make the decisions that we have to to get after the threat and and we can't afford to have the low risk tolerance that we had in the past we've got to be able to move fast and in order to move fast we have to have the budget yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I, and again, you know, this has just been an incredible conversation. So I cannot say thank you enough to, you know, Scott, Charles and Stutz. Really appreciate you guys doing this today. Appreciate you too, Slick. Thanks for what you do. Hey, thanks, Slick. It's been great. Thanks, Slick. And, and thanks, Scott and Stutz. A great conversation. And, and thanks to all of our listeners for uh, staying tuned. Keep it up. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.